So this session is supposed to be our entrepreneurship. Yeah? How many of you here are already entrepreneurs? Raise your hands up boldly. Okay. How many of you here want to be entrepreneurs? So those of you that didn't raise up your hand for the two of them, what are you doing here? We need to, we need to pray for you. What, what is it they're doing here? They're trying to learn. So they're not sure. Maybe you don't, if you're not sure, you just came here to think, okay, let's see what they're even talking about. Let me see your hands up. Then maybe I'll make a decision later. Okay, that's good. You're a bold woman. I love it. Um, I'm talking to you about entrepreneurship. But I'm titling this Don't Follow Your Passion. I'm titling this Don't Follow Your Passion. Do not follow your passion. I'm going to break this into five parts. There are five parts of this session. The first part is called the thing about passion, so you follow me. The second part is called the essence of entrepreneurship. The third part is called three things are involved. The fourth part is called basic need higher calling. And the fifth part is called the ultimate role model. So, the thing about passion, the essence of entrepreneurship, three things are involved, basic needs, higher calling, and the ultimate role model. Let's go back to basics. First and the first point, passion is not purpose. Passion is not purpose. How many of you have read The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren? Raise your hand boldly like you did something good. Excellent. And so if you've read, and I encourage, I mean, I encourage Christians at some point, even if you've been born again for many years, it's very useful to go back and read The Purpose Driven Life. It says the reason why it's the number one most influential book in America for pastors and new Christians. Now, The Purpose Driven Life, many of you, many of you are looking for, many of you are very curious about what your purpose is. There are many, there are many seminars and conferences and services that are focused on purpose. What is your purpose? What am I here for? Why was I created? What does God intend for me to do with my life? And so the shocking thing from the purpose driven life when I read it was that the purpose driven life now makes it clear that your purpose is not about you. Your purpose is not about That was radical. That was, that was the first time I read it many years ago. That was, I thought this was shocking. I came here to find my purpose and the first thing I hear is that my purpose is not about me. Papa Jimmy Life says you were made based on the Bible for five things. One, you were made for God's pleasure to worship him. Number two, you were made formed for God's family to fellowship with his other children. Three, you were created to become like Christ, to be his disciple. Four, you were shaped for serving God, which is ministry. And five, you were made for a mission. Those are five things. And none of those five things have to do with you. So there are many young people that say my purpose in life is to run a business. My purpose in life is to build a factory that employs 10,000 people. My purpose in life, what I was made for, was to make beautiful clothes for people and be famous across the world for it. And this says your purpose, that's not your purpose. That's far from your purpose. That is too small, too insignificant, too flimsy to be the reason why God created you. And the Bible verse, if you look at Exodus 9.16, it says, I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I may show you my power and that my name, my name, my name may be proclaimed across the earth. That's the purpose. What? And we know that all things work together for good for them that love God and those that are called according to his purpose. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you in will, in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his purpose. 
So purpose, the endless search for many young people who have been attending a lot of conferences and seminars about purpose, the fact that purpose is not about your purpose, if you're a Christian at least, you know that you were not formed for a narrow, selfish agenda. You were formed for a higher purpose, for God's purpose. So your purpose is not to be a billionaire. Your purpose is not to run a business. Look, it is so that, so that God will not stop being God if the huge dreams you have, mostly for your financial prosperity, don't come to pass. He has not failed to deliver on the purpose for which you were created. It's not to build a chain of hotels. It's not to build code that reaches millions of people across the world. That's not your purpose. This is the reason why you can be anything. What you choose to be, what your career or your business chooses to be, is not dependent on a thing called purpose. If you are a young person who wants to be a ballet dancer, you became passionate about ballet dancing only because you knew of something called ballet. If you grew up in Saudi Arabia and you had no role models, no images of ballet, you would not be passionate about ballet dancing. If you grew up in the village and you've never seen anybody code before, you've never seen a computer, you have no exposure to the art of coding or developing, you would not be interested in being a developer. So the things that we are so tied to that we think this is our purpose and purpose is to purposely make makeup. <laughs> Those things we are so tied to, you are not born with them. There's a very important book I read by Geoffrey Cavin called Talent is Overrated. You are not born with them. There's a reason why people who come from musical families become musicians, people who come from dry cleaning families become dry cleaning entrepreneurs, people who come from pastoring families become pastors. There is a reason why. Because the things that form your passions depend on the environment in which you were born and the forces that shaped your development as a person. David was a shepherd, a warrior, a singer, a king. He was anything he needed to be at a particular time to solve whatever problem he needed to solve at that particular time. So which one was David's purpose? People say David's purpose was to be king, but you remember that God didn't plan for Israel to have kings. Yes? The Israelites demanded for king. God said, you people are stubborn. Okay, I'm going to give you Saul. Then I'm going to give you. So, David was not born because God gave us free will. So, that's not the reason why David was born. He became a king because a problem arose that needed a king. So, that's not his purpose. God gives you, so there's something I always say to people, God gives you assignments. And those assignments, so those assignments can be accomplished through anything, by being a wife, by being a son, by being a billionaire, by being a pastor, anything. You know, we forget that God said, if necessary, I will raise the most inanimate and almost useless of objects, a stone. That's, it's a message that I don't need your billions that thing you want to be. I don't need it to do what my purpose is in the world. The one thing I need it for is the one thing I cannot do, which is to praise myself. The one thing I need it for is fellowship with me. The one thing I need it for is to follow me because I cannot follow myself. What he doesn't need you for is for you to be a billionaire because he's endlessly rich. What he doesn't need you for is for you to run a business because it's inconsequential. The businesses that were so important in 200 BC are completely inconsequential today. And all the businesses you are running today, if God Jesus tarries, will be inconsequential in a thousand years. Because in a thousand, a thousand years ago, there were no computers and there were no iPads. So imagine if somebody thought that is the reason why God created the person to create iPads. If Steve Jobs assumed that his purpose when he was created was to create iPads. How when you now think of the world in terms of 3,000, 5,000, 6,000 years, then Steve Jobs' life is in that frame irrelevant. So that's the first thing. So don't confuse career with purpose. Don't confuse passion with purpose. Don't confuse, don't excuse.
choose career with purpose. See, why are you not doing this? He said, because my purpose is to be a singer. So why are you not doing a job that can help you pay your house rent? Because my purpose, you cannot distract me from my purpose. So I'm going to owe this house rent until I become a singer. I'm going to keep contesting for reality shows for 10 years while other people are busy building a career because it's my purpose. So that's the first thing we need to dismantle. <laughs> that's what we need to dismantle. It's not your purpose. You know, God took Adam, created Adam, yeah? And he put him in Eden and gave him an assignment. Not as purpose, said, take care of this place. Work and take care of it. Not as purpose. Just, he needed to eat. It was a garden. He needed to eat. The man that he had created needed food. And there is a garden. Who's going to come and plug these things for you? He needs to eat. Because God has created us in this body, because we're in this body, and because we're in this world, therefore, we have mortal needs, the needs of mortality. We need to eat. We need to lie down somewhere and sleep. We need to wear clothes because we went and did the thing that you know us to do. <laughs> so now, a third need that we didn't need. You know, we did that. And so God says, okay, since you are in this thing, you need these things. I'm going to provide them for you. That's why Matthew 6 says, 31, I think, 33 says, do not work, pursue these things the way the pagans do because your father already knows that you have need of these things. He knows that you have need of them. So really, for God, financial prosperity and provision is bajen simi. Do you know what, for those of you who are not Yoruba, bajen simi means take and leave me alone. It's like I know that you need these things. I have something more important for you to do. So don't, like, if you read Jesus Christ, just like I kept saying, don't worry about what you will eat. Don't worry about what you will drink. Don't worry about where you will sleep. Sell all your things and follow me. These things are a distraction. They are not the purpose. You are wasting my time. Get out of here. That's everything I just kept saying. Kept focusing on. This is not why we are here. These things are just housekeeping. I need to eat. I need to drink. I need to sleep. The things that you need to do, the businesses you need to run, the whatever you need to create to enable you to have these things, it's not the reason why I created you. He didn't say, when he created man, if you're looking for what man's purpose is, he didn't say it in Genesis. Because Genesis only said is Genesis 2.7, and God formed man. If you check it, he formed man, then a few verses down the line, then he said, take care of this guardian. Of course, if a man's purpose was to take care of the garden alone, then when he was chased out of the garden, the man decided, deserved to die because now you have no purpose. Am I communicating? Am I communicating? So we need to dismantle that. Passion is not purpose. Passion is a human condition. You are aware, therefore you are passionate. Two, Passion is not assignment. That means that God gives us assignments when we are on the earth. Like God gave Jonah an assignment. God said, go to Nineveh, blah, 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 blah. You do know that story on some level. At least you know the name, of, you know the name Jonah. Yeah? I know that Edad Jonah swallowed a fish or a fish swallowed Jonah. There was Shah a swallow. <laughs> so you know that. Let me explain something to you. God gives people assignments, but God didn't promise them that they will be happy doing the assignment. God gives you an assignment, but God did not promise you that you are going to be joyful doing the assignment. Moses was not passionate about his assignment. Read Exodus 3, Exodus 4. He said, I'm not important enough. What will I say to them when I get there? They will not listen to me. I'm not a good speaker. Then when all has failed, he said, you know what? Just send somebody else. That he had made all these arguments to God all through these chapters. And God said, you are going to go. And Moses said, you know what? I'm not even doing. I have no reason. I don't want to go. 
In fact, the people, you know, there's a place in the Bible where the Bible says that Moses was the meekest, one of the meekest prophets on the earth. There are Bible etymologists who say that that meekness didn't mean humility, it meant being miserable. There are Bible scholars that insist that it meant being miserable. Moses, there was nothing Moses wanted to do less than leave the comfort of Egypt to create something that he wasn't even sure was going to succeed based on a God that gave random orders in the middle of the bush. Imagine that you decide to follow a path for your life based on what you heard somebody say in the bush. We will call you mad. Moses had absolutely no interest in this assignment. Jonah was not passionate about his assignment. I put some, Jonah said in Jonah 1 3, he said, Now, Lord, take my life away, for it is better for me to die than to do this thing that you are sending me to do. Elijah, so courageous, said, 1 Kings 19 4 to 5, Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. This was at the point of assignment. This is God saying, I want you to do this for me. I'm not communicating with you. God is sending prophets. He said, look, I want you, this is your assignment. I want you to do this. Go to Nineveh. Save these people from, from slavery. Take them to a land I'm going to take them to. Confront this dictator. This is God giving people a clear assignment. Simon wasn't passionate about being a disciple. When Jesus Christ met Simon, Simon was fishing. That was his career. That was clearly his passion. Jesus Christ said, leave this nonsense you're doing. Come. I have something I need you to do. Jeremiah, Paul, Gideon, you can go through the Bible. There are people who were given assignments, something that you can call a career. Because when Moses begins to lead the children of Israel, he has become a freedom fighter. So that's his career. His career is to be a freedom fighter. Selected by God. God says, this is your job description. And yet, even though this assignment came from heaven, Moses was not passionate. Jonah was not passionate about it. Elijah wasn't passionate about it. These are people that wanted to do anything but the exact career that God had given them to do. So that's an important thing for you to understand. Because there are people that think, I'm not happy doing this. I'm not passionate about it. I'm not passionate about it. Therefore, I'm not supposed to do it. Because I am not passionate about it. That's a fallacy. That's true. Number three. Passion is not destiny. Paul was a civil servant. In fact, Paul is one of the most interesting characters in the Bible. Paul was a civil servant. Paul was so desperate to kill these people that he went and collected letter of permission to kill people. That was his career. That was his career path. And I can talk, I told you about David, and God stopped him and said, Look, I need you to come and plant me churches. Stop this rubbish. I told you about David. If David's destiny, David's destiny could not have been to be a king because at the time God who gives free will was against the principle or the policy of Israel having a king God could not have determined that somebody's destiny is the thing that is not his design I don't want you to have kings if Israelites hadn't demanded David's destiny would have been deeply and fundamentally different And there are four dangers with passion. So this is all, this is, you need to do it slowly. Are you going, are you with me? Are you with me? There are four problems with passion as a foundation for entrepreneurship or as a foundation for career success. You may not be good at what you are passionate about. Imagine if you go into a hospital and you have a very passionate doctor that cannot use his stethoscope. He said, don't worry, I'm very passionate about it. I've been doing this since I was four. How many of you have seen passionate people walk into the studios of Nigerian Idol or Project Fame? 
if you've seen them, can I see your hands up? And then when they open their mouth, you begin to wonder, from their house to this place, was there no man in Israel <laughs> that could tell this guy, Mashemo, Am I communicating with you? These are deeply passionate people. Some people have been contesting for Project Fame since the beginning of Project Fame. Some people have been going from reality show. Those are passionate people. But they are not good at what they are passionate about. That's one. Number two. A passion for a thing doesn't mean that you are going to build a career out of that thing. What if you are passionate about collecting stamps? What if you are passionate about singing a cappella in a time when Nigerians are like, please, what is that? Add some beats to this thing. What if you are passionate about being an interpreter in your village? And suddenly, everybody in the village now can speak English. Being an interpreter is a valid career path. Yes? In the UN, these are advanced careers. The fact that you are passionate about something doesn't mean that you will like... That doesn't mean you work in that field. It doesn't mean that you will even like working in that field. There are some people that sing very well, but the moment you begin to demand the music from them, the well dries up. They are writers that write, but the moment they need to write every day, it dries up. But they might be doing something, and they might be working in the bank, and every day they come to the bank and they deliver, maybe they are cashiers or whatever, they deliver promptly. But the moment, the thing that they are passionate about, the moment you give it to them to deliver that thing under pressure, they collapse. You may not be good at what you are passionate about, you may not be able to support yourself on your passion. If you are passionate about being a ballet dancer, there's nothing for you to do in Nigeria. This is a reality. Unless your father has money, or you can leave the country, or you are ready to be a pioneer to suffer for a period of time until, when I say suffer, so I'm to check to Jesus name. Until until that career opens up, then being passionate about a thing that has no customers achieves nothing. That's three of the major dangers of insisting that I must do what I am passionate about. So the first time I've used the Bible to show you that there's no biblical foundation for passion as a driver for business or career. And I've come to reality to say that there are many young people who are cast away in the wilderness of joblessness because they are waiting until career and passion align. That's a fallacy. If Jonah had waited until he was passionate about it, Nineveh would have been destroyed. That's the first thing. Now, does it mean that you cannot have a career you are passionate about or a business you are passionate about? No. Because there is a reason why people encourage you to at the least know your passion. At the least know what you are passionate about. Now the practical thing is to begin to align what you are passionate about with the realities of your environment. So I'm passionate about it but there is no job here. So can I do it in church? I'm passionate about it, but there are no customers in Nigeria. Nigerians are not willing to pay for it, so can I do it as a hobby? I'm passionate about it, but Nigerians don't care about it, so can I teach it to my children? There are people who are incredibly happy in this world who spend money to Friday doing things that they don't enjoy doing, and Saturdays and Sundays rejuvenating their energies based on things that they enjoy doing. It's a reality. And it's not an uninspiring reality. Because people have done great things based on things that they were not necessarily passionate about. First and foremost, I doubt that there was any, anybody born of woman who is passionate about manufacturing tissue paper. Now, when they asked when he was three years old, what do you want to be when I grow up? Ah, <laughs> I know. Rose tissue paper. It's impossible. 
but there are people who have created happy lives, happy families, supported ministry across the world by doing things that they were very good at and that people wanted to pay for. Am I communicating? Good. So part two. Business. This is what business is. Business is what am I good at that people are willing to pay for? That's all. That's all. That's what business is about. There's nothing else. Business is not about passion. I think we have already demolished that. Business is what can I produce well that customers are willing to pay for? That's all. Anything that is not these two things is not business. It's like when I say to somebody something, you want to, form a, you want to be a billionaire tomorrow but you have no capital today. So that's not a vision. That's a dream. Wake up. There is nothing. If you are good at it, but there's nobody willing to pay for it, it's a hobby. Simple. Business. The whole foundation of business is based on an exchange of value between customer and producer. It's the basic foundation of business. So if nobody is willing to pay for it, it is not a valid business proposition. That's the thing. That's what it is. So let's not, let's not get it confused. Sometimes a product like Google Glass yeah, is great and useful, but the market is not yet ready for it. Google cannot build a business out of Google Glass. So Google, Glass takes, Google takes Google Glass and puts it in a research department while they continue running their business. Because the moment that Google decides to insist on Google Glass, that's the moment Google will cease to be a business, then they will take up Google Glass as a hobby. One of the biggest mistakes we make is to take Steve Jobs as a role model without understanding the story of Steve Jobs. That Steve Jobs first produced, so this thing, Steve Jobs first produced products that were so unusable that they failed. Then his company made a loss, then he was fired from his company by the grace of God. Then he now went and learned humility. Then understood how to marry his passion with what the market needs. Then Apple brought him back to the company that he founded that he was pursued from because it wasn't making profit. It's like what they say. People say they want to, that Mazuka Beg dropped out of Harvard. So they say they want to drop out of school. They say, please, listen to what they say. They say, Harvard, not help woman. <laughs> Harvard, Harvard. You better finish your degree. <laughs> the moment that there is no customer for what you are selling, it's not a business. The, the, the basic formula for business is product or services plus customer. Any of those elements are missing, you are doing something. You are doing an NGO. Now, when you understand that, then you understand that entrepreneurship is not for dreamers and lazy people. It's not for people who, I don't want to work for anybody. You want to die. That's not entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship is for people that, you know what? We tell you, me. Working for people, making money for somebody else. No, no, no. That's not entrepreneurship. That one is, maybe you want to be a freelance. I don't know what it is you want to be. Entrepreneurship is not simply the desire for unrestrained freedom. That's not entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is not this quest for unrestrained freedom. That is not entrepreneur. If I say I'm the owner of my business, my time belongs to me, therefore I'm not going to see this guy because nobody's going to give me queen. I'm going to lose the clients that's going to lead to the revenue that I'm going to use to pay salaries. Therefore, it looks like I have freedom. It smells like I have freedom. <laughs> but I don't have no freedom. The whole point of the economy that we have now is that everybody is operating tangential to financial resources. That, <laughs> that means that 
the degree of whatever it is we are doing depends on the degree to which we can assess money to keep on moving. So your freedom as a business person, there's a reason Mark Zuckerberg spent how many days in Nigeria last time? Do you think that when Mark Zuckerberg was planning his destiny, he said, I'm going to spend five days in a hot country? Facebook has finished getting 1.6 billion people. You people refuse to do birth control in your country. So your population is increasing. Now, if Mazukabe wants to expand Facebook's customer base to attract advertising, Facebook needs to increase its numbers in countries where they are reproducing at a very fast rate. That is the reason why Mark Zuckerberg came to Nigeria. It looks to you like he has control over his time. But to him, his business demands that he finds his way to Africa. So those of you who are looking for unrestrained freedom should ask the Lord to take you quickly. If it is business you are trying to run, you will not find. Or if it is a successful, growing business you are trying to form, if you want to do a business where you will be in the same office with the same staff, in fact, they will even go. <laughs> the office with the same number of human beings for 20 years, probably. If you want a business that will keep growing, how we change freedom and nothing? Entrepreneurship is not a position, it's an attitude. Entrepreneurship is not something, you know, being a CEO is not hard. What's your name? Ayo. Ayo can go and print card tomorrow and call himself the CEO of Ayo, JKKK Plastics. The CEO title requires no qualification. You can be, the moment you step out of here, you can walk out here and become a CEO. You can take your glasses and sell to somebody and say, oh, what company should I write the check to? Write it in favor of J.K. Rowling's Incorporated. Then you rush to the National Corporate Affairs Commission, you register it, you cash your check. There is no requirement to be a CEO. But a CEO doesn't an entrepreneur make. The fact that you are a CEO, that you have the title, doesn't mean you can be an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurship is an attitude. It's an attitude that incorporates so many things, including delayed gratification. Many of you know the story. I'm going to come back to the story of Jacob. So maybe I should not rush. I should not rush. Being an entrepreneur means the ability to see opportunity. To take advantage of opportunity and to multiply resources. That's what entrepreneurship is. The ability to sit down here and look at this guy and say, the other day I went to speak at Daystar. So my back, I have to smell like back pain. So I sat down. So some guy came to me and said, I noticed you said you had back pain. So I have this product I'm selling. I'm going to give you free. And he sent one to my office. And I used it and it relieved me. So I ordered 10 packs. That is entrepreneurship. That's entrepreneurship. That's entrepreneurship. The ability to see opportunity. So where other people see... Remember when Joshua sent those people to... to whatever... The same people from the same country went to the same place at the same time with the same resources but saw two different things. The same. So, two of you, I send you outside. Go and find out if it's raining. Two of you come back. One says, it is raining. Let us go and hide. One says, it is raining. Grab your bucket. Let's fetch water. The second person is the entrepreneur. So what are you going to use water for? Say, ah, have you forgotten that these people here don't have water? By the time we capture this water, put it inside a bucket, keep it, when their water finishes, we'll go and sell it to them, we'll get a profit, we'll come back, we'll multiply the pails of buckets, the buckets that we have. That process of multiplying the potential from inside opportunity is what entrepreneurship is. Is the capacity to build, to create, to grow. That's entrepreneurship. Let me tell you something. Entrepreneurship is at the heart of the expansion of Christianity. There is a reason why the Catholic Church is one of the biggest investors across the world. 
because the kind of spirit that the kind of let me tell you God chose Paul the same velocity with which Paul was killing Christians is the same velocity he began to use to plant churches it needed an attitude an attitude is that spirit there's a reason why you look at the exploration in private education in Nigeria and it's driven by churches because there is an entrepreneurial spirit in Pentecostal Christianity there is an anointing that spirit is what leads to the acceleration of the gospel so it's an attitude it's not, it's not just about profits it's about creation it's about building it's about growing that is entrepreneurship So it's not about what you do. It's about who you are. They say when venture capitalists are investing in a company, they are not investing in the company, they are investing in the founders. So the experienced entrepreneur looks at this guy and says, this guy. Let me say, when you do a, when you do a, when you're trying to raise capital for a business to grow, you tell your investor, this is how much you're going to make in three years. You make a projection. The investor is not a fool. Everybody knows that your projections are simply guesses. Nobody knows for sure what will happen in the future. What the investor is investing is the ability for you to change when the situation changes. Look at person if all this person's assumptions fail, will this person find a way to pivot and still make a success of this story? That is what venture capitalists invest in. So they're not investing in a business idea. A business idea can change. You can decide that you're going to be importing cordless mics. And tomorrow, all Nigerian churches decide they're going to be, you're going to import wireless mics. And tomorrow, all Nigerian churches decide they're going to use cordless mics. 50% of your customer base is gone. You are stuck with imported microphones that you bought at Forex. Now the dollar price has reduced. What you do with your inventory is what makes the difference between an entrepreneur and everybody else. Because an entrepreneur will find a way. He will find a way. He will find a way. Entrepreneurs are the ones that when the company's income reduces, their expenses reduce. Demon possessed peoples are the ones that when their resources are reducing, their expenses increase. People will not think that they are failing. They are not entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs says, my expenses depend on my income no matter how urgent how desirable the object if my company cannot afford it my company will not buy it entrepreneur is the one that says money to pay salaries is tight therefore I'm not going to take a salary this month because I need to keep my team for a long period of time so they need to see me make a sacrifice so that they can pay their own bills He's not doing that because he's a fool. He's doing that because employees stay because they believe in you. And the moment they stop believing that you have their interest at heart, they move. Entrepreneurship is not something that you break into and everything becomes easy. It's somebody that you are because you see a problem you need to solve. Part three three things are involved. There are two ways to have a successful business. You take advantage of an opportunity. So, Nigerians need fuel for their cars. You have access to an oil block. You set up a business, bid for the oil block, get the oil block, sell the fuel to people. That's business. Take advantage of an opportunity. Or, a business is the creation of value. You see that Nigerians are doing are consuming Nollywood films. There's no way for them to get it at a cheap so so and so. So you create a Roku TV so they can use their phones to watch it. So you created something that didn't exist before. So that you exploited something that existed, which is taking advantage of an opportunity. Or you created something based on a need, creating value. Both are valid. Both are valid. Because I've seen there are the church, the, there are no, there's no you got when people finish church. So you set up a you got stand down the road so that people coming from church can buy you go that's that's business or you decide you know what 
I'm not happy with the quality of you, God, that is in the country. I'm going to create a different level of you, God. So you create something of value. Both of them are ways of forming a business. However, you need three crucial capacities to be able to run a business. You need three crucial capacities to be able to run a business. Number one, the ability to solve a problem. Let's look, at, let's look at the Bible. Let's look at the Bible. Let's look at the kind of spirit of an entrepreneur. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were dejected, so he asked Pharaoh's officials, why do you look so sad? We both had dreams, but there is no one to interpret them. Problem. Yes? Yes? Then what did Joseph say next? Tell me your dreams. Tell me your dreams. Problem, find solution. Now, if you go down to the end of that chapter, you see that after Joseph extracted a promise, when you are free from this, so, so and so, tell the king about me, blah, blah, blah. Do you know what happened? Of course, you know what happened. The butler went, like, look at this idiot. <laughs> Moved on with his life, and the Bible says he forgot Joseph. Forgot Joseph. My boss used to tell me something for me on that many years ago. She said, if you come to me and tell me, uh, my mother died. My stepmother chased me out of the house. No money for food. No money for school. No money for this. The people are going to pity you. But they are not going to respect you. Nobody respects somebody based on the quality of suffering. They respect somebody based on the quality of triumph. So they forgot Joseph. Then 41 happened. You go to 41, 9 to 14. Then he says, then the chief copier said to Pharaoh, yay, I'm reminded of my failures. There was a guy, when you imprisoned me, the guy heard my dream. He interpreted my dream. And things turned out exactly as he predicted. So listen to 14. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought to the dungeon. Brought from the dungeon. Quickly. The reason why it wasn't because the butler loved Joseph. It's not love. Nobody's going to buy your product because they love you the second time. The first time they can buy it because it's my friend. Nobody buys product because they love the person. So it wasn't because Joseph was loved by the butler. Actually, do you remember that the butler had completely and utterly forgotten Joseph? Joseph was the dungeon. That means there was no chance. They could not meet themselves and they would be like, ah, you, you, you forgot me, I'll be you. There was no chance he was forgotten. But Joseph had a solution to a problem. Joseph had a solution to a problem. Then if you go straight to 33 to 41, the same chapter, go down 33 to 41, it says, and now let's, then he, then he didn't just interpret the dream. He gave Pharaoh a solution. Appoint a designer and wise man. Put commissioners. Collect all the food. This food should be held in reserve. Do all of this. He didn't say, give it to me. The Pharaoh said, can I find anybody as wise as you in this whole Egypt? You shall be in charge of my palace. And all my people are to submit to your orders. The only thing I keep out of your hand is my throne. Joseph had a solution. A solution. So, the first capacity you want to have is the ability to solve problems. To solve problems. The second capacity is the ability to be skilled. Skill. Skill. There are three ways of getting skill. Three ways. So, remember what I said. The first capacity you need as an entrepreneur is what? Ability to solve problems. Yeah? The second one is what? Be, to be simple. Be skilled. Yeah? Skill. Not knowledge. Knowledge is here. Skill is knowledge in application. I'm talking about knowledge. You can know everything and you can do it. Skill. Now I want to break skill down to three points. There are three ways to get skilled. One, time. 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 To everything a season. And a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born. 
a time to plant and a time to pluck up. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time of war and a time of peace. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Anybody who has run a business knows that all of these things have happened literally. You know, one of the biggest writers on, on management, Peter Drucker, says that nothing makes a man more religious than running a business. Because when in a business, you are exposed to the reality that the heart of man, <laughs> you begin to pray. The day you cannot pay salary, you begin to fast. The day that you are going to, a, a, a bid, you are going to compete for a bid with somebody else, because you know that if two, if two fast runners begin to run, no matter how good each of them independently are, and how much, whatever it is they do, only one person is going to win. You told us that children of God, and we go and bid for a contract. No matter how much God has promised his riches to the people on the earth, only one person. So as a business person, when you are in a bid, and you know that, okay, I'm ready, I'm qualified, but only one, I'm one of many qualified people. Where do you turn? You begin to pray. Because you know that, this thing can go to me or to somebody else. You've planned an entire business. You said, oh, I want to grow my business by so, so, and so. You have a staff. This my staff is the person that we're going to do the proposal, blah, blah, blah. Then on Tuesday morning, the staff sends you a mail. And so I know you're like a father to me. And I thank you for all the things you've done for me in this business. But I just have to go. The two days before you're supposed to deliver a product to a client, what do you do? begin to worship. You'll be worshiping and be crying. Here I am to worship. Here I am to butter. You begin to pray. Anybody who has run a business understands clearly that the passage of time sharpens your ability to manage people, to manage time, to manage resources. Nobody learns it from the beginning. The Mark Zuckerberg would like to talk about, do you know how he did the shortcut? He, because he had enough money, went and hired somebody who already had experience in managing people. Her name was Sheryl Sandberg. She had already managed a company and retired. And the person said, I don't have the time to learn this part. I want to focus on the product. You already have the skill with managing people and finances. Come and run it. Because only time gives skill. No matter, even if you are a genius. That's why the most genius American musicians have managers. I interviewed Two Face four years ago, and he said, without a guy called Ephraim Morigby, who has been his manager for six years, his career would have ended. Because he says, when they are dancing, he told me, he gave me his, he said, you don't want a manager that went to offer in the club, time is going, you are dancing, then your manager too is dancing, hey, he said that you, have, you are going to die. Then the manager will be like, Two Face, come, come, could you go? That's not a discipline that Two Face had at that time. Therefore, you have to go and get somebody already skilled because you cannot you can have all the money in the world but you cannot buy skill time has to pass the second way to get skill whatever you do do it with all your heart some of you think that this commandment is for people that have good bosses that the only way you apply yourself to your job well is because you be like they are not motivating me and the Bible says this will be your motivation. Don't do it as if you are doing it for an earthly master. Do it as if you are doing it for God. Do it. That means he's a wicked man. But your skill acquisition is not about him. It's about where you are going with your own life. The Bible knows that if he says do it based on the goodness of the man's heart, then all of us are going to be having bad iPad, bad food in the restaurant because the guy slapped the boy. The whole thing will become a mess. So it's like, look, look, you people are fundamentally flawed. Therefore, I'm going to say you that for you to learn the skill you need for your life, you need to ignore the people you are seeing in front of you and focus on the future you have ahead of you. That is the commandment. Luke 19, 27. 
Then another servant came and said, here is your mina. I have kept it. I was afraid of you because you are a wicked man. You take what you do not own. You reap where you do not sow. This is just Jesus giving a parable about life. Then Jesus Christ said, take his mina away from him and give it to the one who has ten. This is a wicked boss. A wicked boss. So the guy had the authority to say you're a wicked man. But God is saying even that one deserves because he did not grow what he was given. Am I communicating with you? Am I communicating with you? Because we are saying who you are doesn't depend on who you meet. If you are a kind person, you are kind whether you are working with a wicked boss or a good boss. If you are a good husband, you are a good husband whether your wife is a quarrelsome woman or she's not a quarrelsome woman. And Jesus Christ is saying, my contract with you is with you. And in any case, it's a, it's a lesson for life. Because when you finish leaving that bad boss, you are the one that's carrying your career to the next place. That's the second way to get skill. The third way to get skill, see that a man diligent in his business. He will stand before kings and not mere men. Message Bible says, observe people who are good at their work. Skilled workers are always in demand and admired. They don't take a back seat to anyone. You know, Proverbs 10, 4 said at the end, diligent hands bring wealth. Let me tell you something. Let me read my favorite part of the Bible. 1 Samuel 17, 33, 37. Saul said, replied, you are not able to go out against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man. He has been a warrior from his youth. You know, when we read the story of David and Goliath, we forget why David won the battle. David did not win the battle simply because of the grace of God. Because if Paul, Paul must plant, Apollo must water, before God can come and give increase. God cannot increase something that has not been planted. So, listen to what David said. David said, so your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or bear came, I went after it and struck it and rescued it. I have killed lion. I have killed bear. It is because I have killed lion and bear that this uncircumcised Philistine is going to fall at my hand. Only this is David saying, he didn't say because the Lord has anointed me who has no skill or capacity because I am here for unmerited favor. So once he sees me, he will run. Am I communicating? Now, the diligence of David was in the bush where nobody was watching and there was no reward to come. The only reason he could stand before kings is because he was diligent in his work. He had fighting skill. Skill comes with time. You cannot kill a lion if you run away from cockroaches. You must first kill a cockroach, then kill a rat, then kill a dog, then kill a lion. Am I communicating? You know one of my favorite pastors, Pastor Joe Olaya, says some of you want to cast out demons and you cannot fast for 40 days. You can only cast out an ant with 12 o'clock fasting. So if it's 12 o'clock fasting, you cast out an ant. If you are ready for Jesus Christ casting out of demons, skill, that's how skill comes. Am I, are you still here? Look at Joseph, Jeroboam, all those people. The Bible says they were honored because of their work. Finally, you should run a business because you know how to grow things. How to take things and people and make them better. How to build systems and structures and processes. The first commandment that God gave was be fruitful. And, and what? And what? There was an order. Be fruitful. That is you first. Then multiply. That is other people. Be 
before you can have dominion. You cannot have dominion over something that you were not part of creating. The thing had an order. First yourself, then others, then I will give you power. You know what I will give you power after the Holy Spirit. So God's commandment was for you to be full. So an entrepreneur, the third, the way to build skill is to, sorry, the way to, um, one of these is to be, fruit, to be fruitful and multiply. You know, we talk a lot about Jacob and how Jacob was crafty. Yeah? But do you see what Jacob was crafty about? His brother came hungry from Feferity. Then he asked Jacob for food. See what Jacob asked for? Something in the future. Something in the future. Do you know that that's why David, Jacob was the same man who had the capacity to work for 14 years because he wants to marry one woman. This was a person that understood the power of time and waiting and taking suffering today for tomorrow's success. That was Jacob's character. That is why Israel could emerge through Jacob. The capacity to grow and multiply. If you read his story with his fa- grandfather, Laban, when he went to leave his sister and so, first of all, he had served him so well. When it was time for him to go, the man said, Ah, don't go. What do you want? I'm going to give you. Because Jacob had lent the capacity to grow things. Jacob even told him, He said, No, you know how I have served you. Jacob could even boast because he was sure. You know how I have served you. It's time for my freedom. Let me go. And then the man began to negotiate. Because even when Jacob was working for the boss, he was already entrepreneurial in his spirit. He was already multiplying things. There's also the part where, in the Bible says, in this world, you will have what? You will have what? You will have what? Tribulation. I always say that tribulation is the plural of trouble. So if I have three troubles, that's a tribulation. You will have tribulation. It's a promise. God has promised you that you will have tribulation. (laughs) That means that there's nothing you can do about it. Problem will come. Many times ago, one of my bosses said, oh, you know, people are going to betray you. I was like, I reject it. He just said, don't reject it. He said, it will happen. People will betray you unless you want to remain on this same level. So, the ability to grow things is also the ability to grow things in times of crisis. Because the Bible says if you faint in the day of adversity, it's your fault. It's your fault. Your strength is weak. Remember, we're just talking in the, we're talking in the, in the green room. That can, can God trust you in a time of pain? Anybody can trust you in a time of plenty. Anybody can trust you. If I keep giving you money and demanding nothing from me, you will like it. If I withdraw the things, then I will know whether you truly love me. And so your ability to continue growing things, even when things are dry, you know, early this year, I had plans for my business. What is great plans? People say many are the plans of a man. Then in March, one day, March 3, I said, Jesus of Nazareth, what happened to all my plans? My cousin said, everybody has a plan. Until they are punched in the face. Now, when you are punched in the face, if you are still able to keep fighting, then you are made to be an entrepreneur. Am I communicating? Entrepreneurship is not the art of unrestrained freedom, it's the capacity to build, to create, to multiply. And since we live in a world where God has said we will surely have trouble, that means that it includes the ability to multiply, even in a time of scarcity. There are businesses that are giving people increase, salary increase, bonuses, as Nigeria is going through this crisis at the moment. There are businesses. There is a reason why we have a business that even when things dry up, we, can, we will not owe a salary. Why? Because we've already saved. 
because we know that surely tribulation is going to come. That is the spirit of an entrepreneur. I get very irritated by people who get broke at the end of the month. If you are the kind of person that gets broke at the end of the month, every month, don't try entrepreneurship. Because what happens is that you know you are going to get a salary at the end of the month. You know that the next, the salary is not going to come until the next month. Why is your money always finishing on the 27th? What is the demon of your father's house that cannot allow you just move the money from the 27th to the 30th? Where are you borrowing when you don't have money to repay back? Where are you borrowing to buy a car that you don't have the capacity to earn the income in one year to refund? Where are you moving to Lekki if your salary is below 100000 do you know that the amount of things, the, the amount of semi lakh in Ebano is fundamentally different from the amount of semi lakh in Vatican M Pharmacy in Suleri? An entrepreneur doesn't make that kind of a mistake. I'm not joking with you. So I'm telling you that entrepreneurship is not a matter of just running a business, it's an attitude that multiplies wealth. Some of you are waiting until you stop being employees before you are wealthy. Meanwhile, is it not in this country that we have someone like Ibe Kachuku? How many of you know Ibe Kachuku? Minister of State for Petroleum. He was an employee for 25 years working for Exxon Mobil. Some people have been running business for 30 years. They cannot afford one of Ibe Kachuku's cars. Wealth doesn't care whether you are an entrepreneur or you are an employee. So when I say that, I mean business person. Employee. He doesn't care whether you're a woman or a man. Do you know when Falon Shalakija got her oil block? Women were not even wearing trousers in Nigeria at that time. This was a sexist country. Worse then. He doesn't care if you're a man or woman. Wealth found Joseph in the dungeon. Well, a man in prison is the worst disgrace. It's the worst helplessness. You cannot go out and see the sun when you want to see the sun. Imagine a man solving problems in such a condition. How will he not stand before kings? How many of you know Otumba Gaddafi? The late Otumba Gaddafi? Shit business is good business. How many of you saw that? Business finally, entrepreneurship is the ability to find something higher than what people can see. Remember what I said about the people that went up and said to Joseph said thing. Somebody saw rain. Somebody saw potential for money. That's how business is. Business is not about... Otumba Gaddafi wasn't selling shit. He was selling comfort. He went to a party and saw that big men after they finished eating rice, eating brokato, Guinness, bring more cake. You know, it's only in parties, Nigerian parties that you see people, cake, meat pie, snack. <laughs> There's no way you won't go to the toilet. And after that, you will see these rich men looking for toilets. Looking for toilets. And if you read this, he said he thought this was so undignified. So what he was solving was in toilets. It's not that the number of toilets in Nigeria had finished. What he was solving was comfort. The ability to find a toilet when you need a toilet. Tara Drotoye is not selling makeup. She's selling confidence. Because there's nothing more confident than a woman whose makeup is perfectly done. She's, if she wants to do makeup, that's not going to MFM or something. She wants to do makeup. She has done her makeup the way she wants it. Then she has worn her stilettos. Then she steps out. She's like, that's what Tara is selling. Facebook is not selling social media. Facebook is selling the ability for you to find your friends from secondary school. That's what Facebook is selling. We say Red is not selling media products. We are selling empowerment. The ability to watch a show or go for an event and feel like you can do what those people do are doing. Apple is not selling devices. 
The reason why people are going to queue up for iPhone 7 when they have not finished using iPhone 6 it's not because they don't have phone at home. Don't you understand? It's not that they need gadgets. It is that there is something Apple is selling that other people are not selling. And Apple is selling beauty. I buy the iPad simply for this. I like the way the edges curve. That's all. You can be marketing surface. Samsung Galaxy Tab, Universal Tab, Togolese Tab. I will never buy it. Because it looks ugly to me. It's not the function that people buy. It's the way it makes them feel. So, entrepreneurs who are trying to get dedicated customers create an experience. And so I'm going to end with this scripture. The same Genesis 41. 41 to 57. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then he took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He had him ride in a chariot as a second in command. And the people shouted, make way, make way. Thus, he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then, the seven years of abundance, we go to 53, in Egypt came to an end, as Joseph had predicted. But they were ready because Joseph had already saved up supplies for seven years. And the seven years of famine began just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands. But in the whole of Egypt, there was food because of one man. Because of one man. What did I say? Entrepreneurship is not a title that you are given. It is the kind of person that you are. A person that creates, enhances, beautifies, increases, multiplies. The kind of person that people shout in front of him, make way, make way. Somebody important is about to pass. God bless you in Jesus' name.